A few months ago, I crashed the old two-stroke dirt bike during a motocross race. And as I was laying on my couch, recovering from said accident, I was thinking about how my helmet and my pads probably saved my life. Okay, but then I was thinking, well, when I'm in a car, I don't have a helmet and a pads on. Heck, sometimes I don't even have a shirt on. What would happen to my body and my head if I crashed a car instead of a bike? Is there a trick to staying safe in a crash when you're in a car? So today, we're gonna look at exactly what happens in car crashes and the things that we found that can actually make some cars we have here at Donut a little bit safer. Let's go. So a car crash is the perfect place to see physics in action. Newton's three laws of motion dictate just about everything that happens to your car and to your body in a crash. So the physics behind crashes is that an object in motion stays in motion, an object at rest stays at rest. This is Becky Mueller, a senior researcher with the IIHS, independent researcher working to test vehicle safety. And what she's talking about is conservation of momentum or Newton's first law. So your body has got to be stopped by some force and to determine how much force, we need to look at Newton's second law, which simply states force equals mass times acceleration. Now in a crash, that acceleration is actually deceleration of the car from the speed it was going to a dead stop. So the more massive your car is, or the faster you're going at impact, the more force the car is going to impart on what it hits. Which brings us to Newton's third law, which states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And to crash, that means that if you were to hit a solid wall with 5,000 Newtons of force, that wall is going to send 5,000 Newtons of force back through your car. So does that mean your body is getting hit with all that force? Well, if you were bolted to the front of the car like Mad Max style, heck yeah, you'd be freaking getting all that force. But mathematically, sitting on the hood of your car would be the same as being in the driver's seat in a totally rigid car that didn't break or bend. It's the same force, you're just placed in a slightly different position. So if we knew we had a totally rigid car, we knew that the average car is around 4,000 pounds, and we knew that bones break with only 4,000 newtons of force, we'd be looking at broken arms in a crash as slow as five miles per hour. But luckily, modern cars are not rigid. They crumple up. These crumple zones are designed to take that incoming force and reduce the amount that makes it to you, the driver. So how do you reduce force? Well, if we look back at Newton's second law, it shows us a pretty simple equation with only two things that can ultimately reduce the force of impact. You got mass, and you got acceleration. We can't really change the mass of your car mid-crash unless you start throwing your mama out the car. Hey, yo! <laughs> so let's look at the other variable in Newton's second law, and that's acceleration. Now, if we were to break down acceleration even further, that becomes velocity over time. And it's this aspect of time that we really want to focus on. Since a crash happens so fast, this makes the deceleration very, very high. But it also means that any small change in time can affect the results of the impact. This is where all safety equipment is geared toward, making the crash take longer. So crumple zones, they're designed to slow your rate of speed and bend with some resistance, but not enough to stay rigid and transfer force. Seat belts. They're there to slow you down before hitting your airbag, which slows you down even more before making contact with your steering wheel. Hopefully you don't hit it though, because then in a 30 mile per hour crash, a seatbelt decreases the deceleration rate by seven times. That's the difference between a bruised collarbone and a concussion. So rather than an impact being over in an instant and therefore creating a super high acceleration, it's dragged out for as long as possible to lower the rate of deceleration. And if that impact goes from a tenth of a second to only half a second, that might not seem like that much, but that's the difference between 10 Gs and 50 Gs hitting your body. It's packaging 101. Imagine if you're shipping a fragile item, you search out a really sturdy box. Then you pack it with your packing peanuts and seal it up with tape. And those kind of items are like your seatbelt and your airbag system where we're cushioning the item inside, the person inside of the, the crash. Those are, are kind of your basic principles. So you've got a layer with some give, that's your crumple zone. You got a rigid layer for structure, that's your unibody or your cab. And you've got another soft layer created by the airbag. It's like a reverse s'more. Get your cracker, get your chocolate, get your marshmallow. 
Just flip those around. So that's the physics of a crash. So modern cars are designed to maximize the time taken to come to a stop while keeping the passenger compartment as unchanged as possible. This means that the actual cabin is designed to stay fairly rigid and prevent parts or the suspension or steering system poking through the firewall or underneath the floor pan. You don't want that, that's not good. So is there a way that I can make my car safer? What if I had a better seatbelt, like a four point harness? I'd be safer, plus start living that JDM life. Yeah, I mean, the manufacturer takes into account all of the different aspects working together. They don't just, you know, throw this airbag from the shelf and this seatbelt from another shelf together and put them in a car. It's looking at the whole vehicle as a system. And when you start fiddling with any of one of those components, it's unknown what effect that might have. So the race car is the same way. It's, it's tuned as a whole system, both the five point harness and the assumption of the Hans device and the helmet and the roll cage are all working as one giant system together. Okay, I'm not prepared to wear a helmet and a Hans device every time I need to go to the store to get some French toast ingredients. But what about the outside of my car? Can I make my crumple zones bigger with some bull bars or some other aftermarket parts? Things like putting those bull bars on the front of SUVs or pickups may uh, interfere or affect the sensors that are in the front of the vehicle that detect when a crash is happening. So it may delay airbags from firing at the right time, or it may confuse the system about, you know, what kind of crash are you in? An airbag takes only 30 milliseconds to deploy, and if working properly, it can deploy some 50 milliseconds after the initial impact. That's fast, and it needs to be that fast to catch your face just the right time. If it's even less than a tenth of a second off, it can go from a life-saving device to a boxing glove. Ouch. But what I really wanna know is what kind of car is the safest. If the time of the crash is the only thing we can really control, wouldn't you want a big car with a lot of room for crumple zones and airbags? Statistically, yes. So in car-to-car -car crashes, if you're in the bigger vehicle, you win. It's the laws of physics. But when in single vehicle crashes, whether it be a vehicle hitting a wall or a pole or a vehicle rolling over, there are uh, increased risks with heavier, higher, bigger vehicles just because of that extra mass that's associated with them. But what about your own body? If you're in a crash, what's the best thing you can do in the moment to keep yourself safe? Well, actually, it doesn't really matter. There are so many different types of crashes that you couldn't just rely on a reaction. You'd actually have to perceive the situation and make a decision, and that takes a lot of time. The average human reaction time is about a quarter of a second, but that is based on either an anticipated action or instinct. The amount of time it takes your brain to process and assess a situation, then act based on that info is much, much longer, and it usually doesn't kick in before your reactionary instinct. Now, in a crash, your body is going to react in that matter no matter what, even if it's not the best move. But what if we could stop those reactions. You might have heard the stories that a drunk driver in a collision is more likely to survive because their bodies are limp. They don't react and tense up in a crash and therefore they don't get hit as hard. Now I am not saying at all the way to survive a car crash is to be drunk. In fact, drunk drivers are seven times more likely to be involved in a fatal accident in the first place. But even putting that statistic aside, there have been dozens of studies done to try and replicate this theory, and they've all shown that there's no value to being drunk. And if you think about the physics we've already gone over, that makes sense. Now, I can't calculate how strong you are, because we've never met, but earlier we said it takes 4,000 newtons of force to break a bone, specifically a typical human femur, which is a pretty tough bone to break. You know, I've broken a couple femurs in my day. You get around me, BAM! <laughs> now the reason I bring up your strength is because you're not strong enough when you tense up real tense and tight, no matter how strong you are, no matter how buff you are, to break the bones in your body. When you tense up your muscles, it's putting a force on your bones, but it can't break your bones. It's not 4,000 newtons of pressure, right? If we look at a 20 mile per hour crash into a wall and a regular sedan, that's over 200,000 newtons of force. When those forces are that high, flexing is only gonna make less than 2% of a difference. So if you're drunk and you're limp, that 2%, that's not gonna help you. And it's also definitely not gonna help you make a better reaction time or make better decisions. 
You've already decided to drink and drive. That's the stupidest decision you could have made. And even if you were perfectly sober, you had a good reaction time and you anticipated the crash, at 60 miles an hour, the car would have already gone 20 feet before you could even react. A crash happens in 100 milliseconds, which is a blink of an eye. And so there's not a whole lot that you can do once that crash has started um, to really avoid or maneuver or anything like that. Becky and her team have done a lot of research, and I mean a lot of research into crash statistics and casualties in the US. There's one thing though that every scientist wants in their data and one thing that you can do that will help you stay safer in an unpredictable environment of a crash. Be predictable. If you're driving in a statistically average way, the safety equipment is better optimized for your safety. Now, let me explain how this works. Okay, the IIHS tests over 200 models every year. And to test each model, they need five cars to properly run each test, and it takes several months to do those tests. For every variable you add to the test, you potentially need to double the amount of testing time. Let's say you wanted to run every test twice, once with a seatbelt on and once with a seatbelt off. But now, what about with just a lap belt on? What about with just a tress? What about with the chest belt under your arm? What about your Ultra Plus seat belt pad on your seat belt? And it's not about how you're sitting or where you're positioning your hands. Even body types factor into crash safety. So we do use anthropomorphic testing devices, more commonly known as the crash test dummies. They come in all different shapes and sizes. They definitely don't represent all aspects of humans. And humans, if you think about it, vary greatly in size and shape. So the test tool that we do have is really great at being able to detect injury risks for the general population. But you wanna to try to be as close to what the car was designed for as possible. The airbag is timed to catch the driver at the perfect point, assuming the deceleration of the body from the seatbelt and things like side airbags and retractable pedals are all designed assuming they know exactly where your body is gonna be. Things that put you outside of the normal parameters of the test can put you at risk. Things like seating position, arm position, if your passenger put their feet on the dash. Catherine, this is for you. I love you, sweetheart. But you gotta stop putting your feet on the dash. They're gonna blow your legs all the way back and then I'm gonna have to be like, hey, this is Catherine, she's a human pretzel. Even things like loose items in your car can become projectiles with unknown consequences in the event of a crash. Now, thanks to the data from these tests, OEMs have made cars even safer, but not everyone drives a brand new car with the newest safety testing. One of our riders here at B2B, Joey, his car's 30 years old. Well, you don't have to worry too much because there is one thing that can absolutely help. So what am I gonna be able to do? Uh, I can't afford a new car. Number one thing that you can do to help yourself in any kind of crash is to wear your seatbelt. To wear your seatbelt. Your seatbelt. What the f***? Okay, I'm gonna be a straight shooter with you guys. We honestly thought that we would find a sexy answer to this question. Some secret that nobody knew that we would bring to the masses. Well, as it turns out, the IIHS, the NHSTA, and a bunch of other organizations already found out what that sexy answer is, and it's wearing your seatbelt. And there are still many crashes, especially in, in the newest good rated vehicles where I'm looking through real world crashes and I'm like, boy, that's a shame. That person wasn't wearing their seatbelt. They died. I guarantee that if they had been wearing their seatbelt, there are all these other examples of people that survived and walked away. Didn't just barely survive, but would, could have walked away without a scratch. It turns out the best way to survive a crash was that thing right next to your shoulder all along. Freaking seat belts, staying in a normal driving position, keeping your safety equipment unmodified, and of course, not being intoxicated can all increase your chances of surviving a crash. Uh, I wanna thank Becky from the IIHS for sitting down and talking with me. She was really cool. Thank you guys so much for watching B2B. You wanna see more kind of behind the scenes stuff of Donut? We cut a lot of stuff out. Well, sometimes we put that stuff on what we call the Donut Underground. There's a little button down there. You can hit join until next week. Bye for now.